There's a guy named Ian Paul. I came across this article. He's actually a theologian from, from the UK. And he had this article called Seven Surprising Things About the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Now, we're not going to walk through it all. But it was something that kind, of, that kind of percolated in my mind about what exactly what did he find that were different. Now, for many of you, you may be familiar with this passage that we're going to look at in, in Luke 10. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with this particular picture. Uh, this is from Jacob uh, J uh, Jordan's rendition of what the Good Samaritan passage was like. And so with this, we're going to take some moment to, to walk through some of this, but also to take a look at maybe a couple of different angles that you may ha not have seen before. So let's, let's jump into this. Because in Luke, in, um, in this passage in Luke 10, just before Luke 10, uh, there's this whole part where Jesus has a conversation with the experts. All right? And in fact, it, it, this is actually paralleled both in Matthew and in Mark. And so some people have thought that this is the same, t this is the same episode uh, shared in different ways. Others have said that this is actually several different time periods. So it's not just, it wasn't just a one-time occurrence. It was a couple or two or three, or maybe multiple times when Jesus has been asked this question. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to ask for those of you who like to read along uh, out loud, um, when the passages come up, I'm going to invite you to do that if you'd like. But if you look at, let's say, the one in Mark, okay, this is what it says in Mark 12. I'm going to ask uh, if someone would like to read this passage for us. We can keep going. Yeah. Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Right, and so, yeah, sorry, keep going. <laughs> And so in this particular episode, what happens is, is that Jesus is having this conversation. He's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers, right? And many of you are familiar with this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. With, it's, it's actually, it's actually a, a reflection back on Deuteronomy 6 called the Shema, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, right? And love your neighbor as yourself, now, when you go into the Luke passage, there's a slight difference. Let's see if you can notice this. This is Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Anyone like to read this? One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, which commandment is the greatest in the law? Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your So did you notice the difference? Right? So in Mark, right, Jesus responds. And then in Luke, Jesus says, well, what do you think? Now, whether this person heard Jesus say this before, or whether it was based on his own study that he realized this is what the greatest commandment is, that's what he, ref he responds, right? And Jesus says, you're right. Good. You got it. Now do it. Now, it's interesting, right? You go on to the next passage in the next verse, and what does it say? Anyone like to read? The man wanted to justify his action. So he asked Jesus, I knew it was my neighbor. Yeah. And Jesus said, right? And so he has this, so already this guy has a certain motive. Luke tells us that he has a certain motive in mind. So he asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, well, what do you think? And so he says, well, this is what I believe it is. And Jesus says, you're right. So go and do it. But then in verse 29, what does it say? It says, well, who is my neighbor? Because Luke gives a bit of a clue. Because this guy who's asking the question actually already knows the answer. But he doesn't necessarily want to know what the answer is, does he? Right? 
And so Jesus then tells this parable. And so we're going to walk through this parable together. All right? And so, first, this whole question is, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds with this parable. Let's start in verse 30. So a little bit of context here. So Jerusalem, so it talks about how this guy went from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem to Jericho, so the likely there's a high chance that the, one of the reasons why this guy was in Jerusalem was because that's one of the central places of worship. And so this person, who was a Jewish man, likely went there for a time of worship and then is going back to Jericho. Now, Jericho is about eh, 28, 30 kilometers, give or take, right? It's kind of like if you went from Mimico, if you walked from Mimico to Wonderland. That's about the distance we're looking at. Not really far, but it's, it's a bit of a travel, all right? <laughs> right? And so, and so it, it obviously it would take several hours to get there. Now, if you look at the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's not like a nice, paved, open space kind of a thing. It was actually kind of like almost this trench. And to walk through it was not, it was not always advisable, especially at night. Because if you notice that even this terrain, right, there's all these places where you don't see where people are. And many, many times, this is where you would have people who would attack others would rob others. They would see it, and they would, and because they knew this. And so when you're traveling through this place, it was a place that, that you, A, you shouldn't have gone by yourself. So this guy already is kind of traveling on his own, which makes him an easy target. And now, what happens? He's robbed, he's beaten, he's stripped, and he's just left there for dead. All right, let's keep going here. And so we have, so Jesus continues on and says, so if you picture this, in this kind of deserted place, you have this guy who's basically been beaten over and over and over again, and just left there almost essentially half dead, with nothing. Literally nothing, not even clothes, just left there with nothing. And then, and then first comes a priest. Now, this is not a joke, <laughs> Right? But first you have a priest, right? And this priest who is walking from Jerusalem, presumably from Jerusalem to Jericho, has come along the same path, and he sees him. And then Scripture says that then he went to the other side and kept going. Then after that, you had a Levi. A Le the, what the last translation we saw said a temple assistant. That was actually, can be translated as Levi, who was actually one of the tribes of Israel. They were the, one, the tribe that was meant to assist the priest in their work. And so first you had the priest, who then went to the other side, and now you have a Levi, who, is also, who has also been well-versed in what it meant to, to serve, and now he goes to the other side. And he just keeps going. So let's keep going here. Verse 33. Now, not all the translations use that word despised. A few, a few do. Some of them use certain Samaritan, or some use other words. But the idea is, is that with the Samaritan, here's the context that we're looking at. Because, so Samaria is a space between Galilee and, and Judea. And so it's kind of like this middle space. Now, what happened, though, is that, especially back at about just after the, during the exile and afterwards, the Jewish people who kind of settled in that area started intermarrying with other people. And so there's this kind of mixture of races. And that's what, how they came to be known as the Samaritans. 
And the thing is, is that the Samaritans had a certain understanding. Now, granted that they, they had Jewish understandings, and so they did follow the Torah, but they also incorporated other religions as part of their belief system. And so it was kind of like a patchwork of different religions. While, yes, there was a Jewish influence in there, they were actually influenced by all these different religions. And for them, they believed that instead of going to Jerusalem to worship, they actually went to a place called uh, Mount Ger uh, Gerizim, which, as you see in that map, is just kind of a little bit north of where, of where Jerusalem is. Now, the tension there between the Samaritans and the Jews and the Israelites was very strong. I mean, in our own Canadian history, we read about some of this, right? Between those who were, who were, who were uh, indigenous to Canada, those who were settlers in Canada, and then you had the Métis works were a mixture. And a lot of times, they were seen as uh, op opposition on both, on both ends. You weren't really indigenous, you weren't really a settler, you were kind of in the middle. And there was this, there was this tension. And that's what the Samaritans were like. The Samaritans basically became a group of people who, who, who had this kind of, who had their, you know, their shoulders up, right? They were defensive. They, were, they, they, they wanted to be legitimate because others did not necessarily see them as legitimate. In fact, there's one part in the chapter before, in Luke chapter 9. There's a part where Jesus is going to Jerusalem, and this is what he shares. I'm going to ask one of you to read this passage for us. So already, there's this tension that reveals a certain tension already, right? To the point where, A, when Jesus is passing through, the Samaritans say, oh, you're going to Jerusalem, you're one of them, no, we don't want you here. And then you have the opposite reaction of, well, if you don't want us here, let's just kill them all. <laughs> Which, let's face it, nowadays, we have that in our own midst sometimes, don't we? You have people who have so diametrically opposing views that you can no longer see the other as someone who got created. There's tension of contempt, essentially. If, if you don't understand the way I do, if you don't think the way I do, then you don't deserve to live. We, ha we see that today. We see that on the news. Sometimes we see that in our own families, don't we? And yet, it's Jesus who's using the Samaritan in this story. Let's keep going here. And Who was it who was the neighbor? You know, in verse 33, it says that the Samaritan looked at this man, and it wasn't like he was someone back in chapter 9 who looked at someone traveling from Jerusalem and said, you're not worth my time. It said, I looked at him with compassion. And that word compassion actually says he, was, he literally was moved in his bowels. Now, it wasn't that he had indigestion or anything, but rather it was something that he was so moved that in the pit of his stomach, that's somehow some of us might use that language, right? In the pit of his stomach, he looked at him and he said, how could I leave this person alone? 
And so he takes care of him. He puts him, he gets off, off, off his donkey, puts this man on his donkey. He brings him to the next town. And then he takes care of him there and then says to the innkeeper, I'm going to give you essentially two days' wages. Each, each silver coin was one day's wage, basically. And he says, I'm going to give you two days' wages. I'm going to pay you ahead of time. And if there's anything else, I'll take care of it when I come back. And then Jesus asks, who is the neighbor? Now, through the centuries, this, this story has been looked at in different ways. In fact, if you go back to the early church father, sorry, the early church fathers, there's one guy named Origen, uh, who lived around about the late 100s, 200s AD or so, give or take. And he actually suggested that this was an allegory. The story was an allegory. And so he suggests that the man traveling is actually Adam, that Jerusalem is paradise, Jericho was the world, so he's going from paradise to the world, and that the robbers were this hostile power, the priest was the law, the Levite were the prophets, the Samaritan is Christ, the wounds are disobedience, the donkey is the Lord's body, the inn is the church, the manager is the head of the church, the, the Samaritan's promise is essentially the Savior's second coming. Now again, so when this story was passed on for the first century or two, that was the understanding. It was this allegory of what this reflection of what the world was like, at least what they thought it was. So that was one way of looking at the story. Now, since then, most theologians have, have kind of brushed that aside. So most of this don't necessarily look at it as an allegory, although it's interesting, right? If you, if you read the story in that way, it's interesting to see how, at least how Origen matches some of this stuff up. There's another guy named Alist, uh, Alistair Roberts, who's a theologian down in the U.S. I'm just going to read this quote. It says, Some have observed that the parable of the Good Samaritan is, in part, a commentary on Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The pouring on of oil and wine is a sacrificial action. That is how you might act toward a sacrifice. And so Roberts is suggesting here is that this actually, the whole idea of the Good Samaritan parable is not just a question of how do I react with other people? It's not just about social interactions. It's not about how do I relate to others. Roberts is suggesting that this is actually an act of worship. To serve another in a way that you did not expect to, to serve this other that you don't normally associate with, is actually considered an act of worship. Some people, when they've looked at this passage in the past, have said, well, you know, when they looked at the priests and the Levi, they're thinking, well, I mean, the Scripture tells us, if you look at Leviticus chapter 21, it says that if you touch anything that's unclean, right, if you touch a corpse, then you're now unclean. And so there have been some people have suggested that in, in some ways you, you, you can't blame the, the priest and the Levi for passing this guy by, right, because, because you're not supposed to touch anything that's unclean or else you will become unclean. And yet, a few things with that. Because on the one hand, because on the one hand, A, if you look at the whole idea of, of that law in Leviticus 21, it refers to the priest, although technically the priest can actually touch the corpse of an immediate family member. So it isn't like you can't touch any corpse. You just can't touch the corpse. You, you, you're, not, you're supposed to stay away from corpse, especially as you're about to go serve. Otherwise, you're going to be considered ceremony unclean. Although that law does not apply to the Levites. So the Levite actually had no excuse for bypassing this person on the road. But then even... If you look at the priest, a couple of things. One is, is that, A, this person was likely going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He had finished his time of worship and is now walking away. So he could have helped and then gone for the ceremonial cleaning and would have been ready for the next time. But then even if you look at the Jewish commentary called the Mishnah, one of the quotes in there it says is that, is, is that, Sacrifice is essentially 
your act of worship. To attend to another, to attend to essentially a neglected corpse is part of your act of worship. That's what it says there. And so while on the one hand, superficially, it seems like it's okay that, you know, oh, sure, let's give an excuse for the priest and Levi to walk by. Actually, Jesus in the story is saying, actually, they missed the point. To serve this other is your act of worship. So who is our neighbor? You know, some of us are familiar that Jesus has said, you know, it's not just love others, but he also says, love your enemy. You know, that person who irritates you. You know, that person when you look at a part of you actually says, I don't want anything to do with you, or you're not worth my time. And let's face it, when I say that, someone probably pops in your mind right now. I know it has for me. And yet, in that, Jesus says, ask you, who is your neighbor? There's a sister church within our CBOQ family called uh, Thornhill Baptist Church. I admit I don't know all the details of what's been happening there, but some of the things I've heard is this. Their church that was, you know, has been in that, uh, that Young and Steel's area now for about, yeah, 60, 70 years or so. In a lot of ways, they're, they're very similar to us in terms of their history, in terms of where they've come from. About 10 years ago, very Caucasian church. And about five years ago, something changed. It wasn't necessarily something that they sought to do. But all of a sudden, in their church, they started getting these Iranian immigrants and refugees coming. And, they, and something drew them to this church. And at first, the, the church didn't know what to do with this. They were like, okay, well, they're here. Let's, let's, let's help them understand Jesus. And, and it got to the point where now there's this whole influx of people, of Iranians. They have this whole Iranian ministry that is just flourishing. Over the last four years, if I, understand, if I remember correctly, over the last four years, they baptized over 400 people. Baptism every month, basically, about 10 people every month. And this church, that was not, again, it was not that they looked, like, looked at the Iranians and said, we don't want them, but they had, that wasn't part of their original outreach ministry. They had no clue this was happening. All of a sudden, Jesus brings them in, and they start talking about Jesus and sharing Jesus and loving like Jesus. All of a sudden, you have 400-plus new family members. I mean, we've had a similar history too, haven't we? A few years ago, we sponsored a Syrian refugee family. That wasn't what we expected to do, but we were called to do that, and we did. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Dave, in his message, asked this question, right? He, he challenged us, do we see people as Christ sees them? A moment ago when I said, you know, that person who irritates you, who, right, who sometimes, you know, bugs you, that person that popped in your mind, do you see them as Christ sees them? And maybe as a church we need to ask the question, do we, are there groups of people within our neighborhood, our community, maybe beyond, that we don't notice, that we need to notice? And I'll be honest, I don't know who that is yet. But through the next few months, as Pastor David's been leading us through this time of discernment to understand what does it mean, right, to be a community of Christ, sharing Christ with our communities, this is part of the question. Who is our neighbor? Who are those individually and as a church that we have not noticed, that we need to notice? Who are those that maybe we have whether it's an irritation towards or maybe even apathy towards. That Jesus now says to Mimical Baptist, you need to pay attention because this is your act of worship.
Some of you are familiar with this. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. Can I have someone read this, please? Okay. In a moment, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a moment to pray. This is what we're continuing to do over these next few weeks, is we're asking these different questions of what does it mean for us to be this community of Christ, and what does it mean for us to share Christ with our communities? And in our service, in a moment, we're going to take some time to ask, maybe, maybe there's something that pops in your mind. Now, who is our neighbor? Maybe at the end of the day, it's someone that we didn't expect to help in the name of Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start us off in a time of prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray silently. To ask God that question, both individually and as a church. Who is our neighbor? Right? Not just the people we hang out with. But who is the neighbor that we haven't noticed? Who is the neighbor that we haven't paid attention to? Who is the neighbor that God is slowly starting to say, hey, this is your act of worship? I'm going to invite you as you pray, and maybe God will reveal something in the next moment. And if so, write it down or text it or email or whatever. Maybe it's something that comes later. Maybe it's something that during this week, as you continue to pray on your own, you're thinking, oh yeah, that's the person that I need to think of, or maybe this is the group of people that we should, as a church, reach out towards. Maybe, whatever that might be. Who knows what God might reveal? And then I'll close our time of our prayer, and then we'll continue on in worship. All right? So let's pray. So Jesus, you challenged us with this question, who is our neighbor? You challenge us as individuals, but you also challenge us as a church. And so in this moment, Jesus, Holy Spirit, perhaps you would reveal something to us now, we ask. So, Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you've revealed so far. And in these coming days and weeks, help us to pay attention to those moments when you continue to reveal who our neighbor is. And help us to be obedient in answering that. In all this, we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen.